Hey everybody, I'm Grandmaster Ben Feingold here with our weekly lecture series. This lecture is sponsored by Rob Venerus. I want to thank him for sponsoring the lecture. If you want to sponsor a lecture, contact my wife Karen. Her email is karen at atlchessclub.com and you can sponsor a lecture. Our lectures are weekly on Monday nights and the sponsor wanted the lecture to be on the greatest players of all time and Karen and I decided to do a top 10 list. So I'm going to show you an excerpt of who I think the 10 best players of all time are of each of their games. So typically I show about four games, um, but now I'm going to show 10. So this lecture may last longer than usual. On the other hand, I'm not showing the whole game, just the brilliant part. We'll, we'll skip the nonsense. Okay, and we're going to do this in order from 10 to 1. I absolutely guarantee you nobody will have the same list I do. However, I also guarantee whatever list you make up, people that are watching live or people that are in YouTube land, nobody will have the same 10 in the same order. Impossible. But typically, on most people's lists, you'll probably see like eight of the same people. And then maybe on a couple, you guys will disagree. I think three honorable mentions that I want to mention that didn't make my list, but were very close, are Smyslav, Botvinnik, and Pillsbury. Those are the three people I considered putting on my list, but they just didn't make the cut. Man, the truth hurts. Okay, number 10 on my list would be on a lot of people's lists, and he's also watching the, the uh, watching live, Vichy Anand, although it's probably not Vichy, it's probably another Anand. And um, I've known Vichy since 1986, and we actually played in a tournament there, and we've hung out, and he stayed at my apartment, we've shared hotel rooms, we've played a lot of blitz chess, and I ranked him number 10 of all time, because if I didn't, he would beat me up. Okay, this is a game he played Vasily Ivanchuk in Linares 1998, and Anand is black, and he ended the game in brutal fashion. So Anand played the move, bishop takes d5, and white would prefer to take with the queen, but taking with the queen is risky, because if queen takes e1 check. Exactly. So Ivanchuk didn't do that. So instead, Ivanchuk played the move that doesn't lose immediately, which is e takes d5. Okay, and in this position, Anand played an amazing move, uh, which is why I... The two reasons I put certain positions up, one is because the moves are good, the, the position's good, and also hopefully you haven't seen it before. I didn't want to get the most famous games, because then you're like, I already saw that. Okay, and I want to remind the viewers, especially the last one, to mute themselves, since he forgot to do so. Okay, in this position, Anand took another advantage of the fact that the queen can't move, and he played the move rook takes c2. So you can't take with the queen because queen takes the rook is equally devastating as it was the last move. So he took with the king and then queen takes a2. Anand sacrifices a whole rook and he's just going to attack the king. And Anand says, well, your rook on h1 isn't really in the game at all. So I didn't really sacrifice anything and your king's not going to escape. Okay, and white's king has a terrible time trying to get out of the, the mess here. He played f4, blocking the bishop. But more importantly, I think when his king gets checked and he's running away, he wanted the f3 square for his king. Since the pawn's on f3, his king can't go there. So I think that's the main reason he played f4. Okay, rook c8 check. Here comes the king hunt. King d2. Bishop takes f4 check. King e2. Queen takes b2 check. King to f3. Anand played rook to c1, and I'm sure that Anand saw this variation when he sacrificed the rook. Although I must say, if black doesn't win the rook back, black already has four pawns for a rook, and he has two connected pass pawns on the queen side, a passed e pawn, and with opposite color bishops, the attack should work anyway. So probably black is winning in any case, but rook c1 wins a lot of material, so here Ivanchuk resigned. Uh, the only move that makes any sense to me um, to, to, save the, to save the rook is queen e2. I don't see another move that makes any sense. Okay, and now uh, I have more than one way to win, but I'm thinking uh, rook c3 check. 
and then the king has to go to g4, and then rook g3 check, and the king has to go to f, uh, f5, rook g5 check, because we're having fun, king e4, queen d4 check, and rook back to g3 checkmate. White's pieces aren't doing a good job defending the dark squares. So instead of playing queen e2 and losing like that, or the other move you could play is queen takes, but black has a decisive material advantage here. Black has a queen and four pawns for two rooks. That's, that's too much. Okay, so after rook c1, Ivanchuk resigned, and I've never seen this game before, but that was sort of the point of the lecture was to show you great games from my favorite players who typically we haven't seen. Okay, and that game is number 10. Uh, when I say the game is number 10, the player is number 10 on my all-time list. Okay, let's go to player number nine. The ninth best player of all time, according to me, is Emmanuel Lasker. Okay, and we'll have to flip the board. And this is actually one of Lasker's most famous combinations. And let me see who he was playing. Was he playing Rufus or Doofus? He was playing Johann Bauer in Amsterdam 1889. I've been in Amsterdam, but it was 1989. That's where I beat Gelfand. Okay, and in this position, uh, White played the move knight h5, attacking on the king's side, and Bauer played knight takes h5, and if you were playing a blitz game, you would automatically just take the knight. Oh, give me the knight. Okay, that's the George Benson move. But instead, Lasker played a series of brilliant sacrifices. Otherwise, he wouldn't be ninth greatest of all time. Lasker played bishop h7 check, queen takes h5 check, and then bishop takes g7, threatening queen h8 mate. Okay, so, and also white could take the rook if you stop mate. I could play rook f3 to g3. So, so black took the bishop. Black's up two bishops. What else? Queen g4 check. King f6 doesn't escape because queen g5 is mate. So that would be a bad move. So he played king to h7, rook to h3, threatening rook, h, rook f3, threatening rook h3 mate. And this is why black played king h7 instead of the move king h8. This is very important. Uh, this game is pretty famous. That is correct. Okay. Uh, when people chat, it messes everything up. But thanks for chatting. And I, I can't get rid of this? Okay, good. I got rid of it. Okay, and the reason he played king h7 instead of king h8 is white, black can play e5 now, and after rook h3 check, queen h6. Now, the world that I want to live in, which I don't live in, is Lasker didn't see e5, queen h6, and he sort of lucked into it. That's the, that, that would be funny to me, but that's not what happened. Lasker saw what was going to happen. And after rook takes queen, king takes, if we just count the material, black's doing great. Black has a rook and two pieces for a queen, although black's king is a little iffy. But white plays the move queen d7, and this is what Lasker saw when he sacrificed both bishops, that he would win one of black's bishops and be up material. And black didn't resign. Black played on for some reason. Not sure why exactly. And eventually he resigned uh, in this position. Check, and we win the rook on, on b7. That wasn't necessary, but that was fun too. And then even here, black didn't resign. Very suspicious. Okay, players weren't so good back then, I guess. Queen takes being mean, and now black resigned. This is the best position black's had in a long time. Okay, but black should have resigned earlier, but. Okay, so that was one of Emmanuel Lasker's most famous games. And it actually introduced this idea of bishop h7, bishop g7, which has been done many times since. Okay, the eighth greatest player of all time. Even I'm wondering, I made this list so long ago. The eighth greatest player of all time is, let me get rid of this, Mikhail Tall. This is a game he played in the Soviet Union in 1963 against unknown player. Now, if it's an unknown player, it's at least 50-50 that this was in a simultaneous exhibition. Okay. And in this position, Tall played knight takes e6 because he's tall. And one of the reasons I put Tall in the top 10, and I didn't put some other ones, is Tall was really good in his 40s and 50s. And he was always in terrible health 
And I think if his health was better and he drank less and smoked less, he would have been world champion longer and more times. Okay, knight takes e6, sacrificing a piece, as tall as want to do. But that's only one of like 10 sacrifices that's coming. Okay, queen g4, threatening queen takes e6 check, which is actually leading to mate. If it was white's move, then this is mate in two. Check, and then queen takes e7 mate. So he played queen b6, defending the e6 pawn. Is there a better way to defend the e6 pawn? The answer is fries. Okay, then rook to d6, because that's interference. That stops the queen from defending e6. Okay, so bishop takes d6. Queen takes e6 check. Black has three legal moves. Uh, I'm sorry, black has two legal moves. Bishop e7, hanging mate in one to queen takes bishop. And the move that he played, king f8. And now Tall, this is a famous story that I'm making up right now. Tall looked at his watch now and said, oh, it's time to sacrifice some more. And he played the move bishop c4. That's the move you were thinking of. And the idea is to play queen f7 mate, but the actual idea is to play rook f1 check. And the bishop was on f1, now the bishop's not on f1. Okay, always play bishop f1. Okay, so black took that piece also. Rook f1 check. Black played knight f6. The other legal moves are queen f2 and bishop f3. That only staves off the inevitable. And after knight f6, Tall looked at his watch again. Time to sacrifice more. Sacrifice the exchange. Rook takes f6 check. Only legal move and then checkmate. Okay, and Tall did this so often that a lot of his sacrifices are famous. And maybe Black was a famous grandmaster, but he was embarrassed. So they put NN. NN, the worst player in chess history, losing games for hundreds of years. I don't know how he played chess for so long. He was losing games in the 2000s, the 1900s, the 1800s. How did he do that? You know, in the last 10 or 20 years, it's very rare to see NN. I think he retired. Okay, so I have Tall as the eighth greatest player of all time. Let's go to number seven. Number seven is Boris Spassky. Boris Spassky I have as the seventh greatest player ever. And this is his most famous game ever. The game is so famous, it was in a movie. Okay, you didn't see that movie, but I did. It's called From Russia With Love. And the player who was playing, they called Kronstein. Close. Okay. And the director didn't like where some of the pieces were, so he moved them away. So most of what happened in From Russia With Love the opening scene, the chess scene, it's like this position, but the director said, get rid of some of those pieces. Okay, he didn't like where they were. And what's funny is the movie was made over 50 years ago, and they had this giant chess board that they were showing the moves in this great tournament. Okay, so this is the position, Spassky Bronstein. Spassky played knight d6. He didn't know which piece to sacrifice. He's sacrificing his rook, and he's sacrificing his knight. Now, the knight's on e4. We need to clear e4. And if you play knight f6 check with the idea of playing queen h7, you're going to be unhappy because knight takes knight, defends h7. So that's, that's not good. Okay, so he played knight d6. And Bronstein said, I don't have to take your rook. And he played knight f8, stopping queen h7 check. And Spassky said, Please take my rook. Take my rook. I want to be famous. And he played knight takes f7. And Bronstein's like, all right, I'll take your rook. Takes his rook and makes a queen. Here comes the other rook. And now white's threatening, knight takes queen. So black has to either walk into discover double, triple check, or black has to move his queen. He played the move bishop f5, not doing any of the things I said to stop white from mating for a move or two. Queen takes f5, and then queen d7. Now he wants to trade queens, and he's up in exchange, so that would be good. Queen f4, he doesn't want to trade queens, and the attack is too strong. Bishop f6, he played knight to e5, attacking the queen on d7. Queen e7, bishop to b3, threatening all kinds of discovered checks. Bishop takes knight, knight takes check. King h7, queen e4 check, and in this position, black resigned. Uh, white has more than one way to win, but the most winning after king h8 
is, and again, there's more than one move that wins here, is rook takes f8 check. Okay, this move is annoying because knight g6 check is coming. And Bronstein, unlike the previous NN, he saw what was going to happen and he didn't want to see it. Okay, so if rook takes, we have knight here check. This is the only legal move because my bishop defends g8. And now you can win the queen if you want to, if you want to. If you don't want to, you can play double check and then queen h7 mate. Okay, and then if you take with the queen, it's the same thing but worse. Knight g6 check, knight takes queen double check. If you use descriptive notation, that means you're older than me probably, and you knight takes queen double check, you don't get to write that on your score sheet very often. That's an unusual move. And then after king h8, queen h7 is mate. So instead of all that checkmate stuff in this position, black resigned, just like in the movie when black resigned. And people were clapping in the audience in the movie, and even his opponents stood up and clapped, just like in real life, except for one thing. Man, when I beat people, they never stand up and clap. They do something else. Okay, so that was the famous Spassky game with Bronstein. And he's my number seven player of all time. 10, 9, 8, 7, carry the one. Okay, so we have Anand at number 10, Lasker at number 9, Tall at number 8, Spassky at number 7. Let's see who's number 6. And the answer is Jose Raul Capablanca. And this is a game I've never seen before, and the end was really tricky. This is against Rudolf Spielman, not to be confused with Jonathan Spielman, because Rudolf Spielman lived 100 years ago, and Jonathan Spielman lives now. And also, they spell their names differently, and they're from different countries. Other than that, they're the same person. Okay, so this is Capablanca Spielman. Now, usually when I show a puzzle or a position, people ask the same question. They ask me whose turn it is. Okay, well, if it's Black's turn, Spielman would play Rook F1 mate. And then Capablanca would go down. He'd be number 10 or something of all time. Terrible. Okay, but Capablanca saw that, and he played Bishop F4, which stops the mate. This is no longer mate because I can take the pawn. Your, your queen's not, not, whoa, your queen's not defending it anymore because my bishop blocked it. So after bishop f4, Spielman saw his queen was attacked and moved his queen away. Okay, that's, that's how good players were back then. And he played the move queen to d8. Okay, and then Capablanca said, you were threatening rook f1 mate, now I'm going to threaten mate. And he sacked the exchange, always sacked the exchange. Now, black has a problem White's threatening queen takes pawn mate with advantage. White is up a bishop, and if you take the rook, you get back rank mated. You know why you're back rank mated? Because white's bishop's on f4. If it wasn't, black could play rook f8 or queen f8, but the bishop on f4 blocks the rook. So after rook takes e7, white's up a piece, and white's threatening mate, and you can't take either piece. If you take the bishop, then you get mated in one. Okay, now we are very lucky, very lucky, that Spielman didn't resign here. Okay, and the reason is Capablanca did something brilliant, which we would have missed. He played the move, queen f8, stopping queen takes g7 check. And Capablanca said, I'm not number seven of all time because you stopped queen takes g7 check. Or is it number six? S 10, 9, 8, yeah, number six. I'm not number six of all time because you stopped me from playing queen takes g7. And in this position, these pieces are sort of attacked. Eh, the rook's not really attacked because we have back rank mate, but the bishop is. And Capablanca said, excuse me, you didn't stop my threat and played queen takes g7 check. Confusing the audience. Okay, I'm not confused, although I was when I first saw it. Okay, and Spielman resigned. If Spielman didn't resign and took the queen, Capablanca would play rook e8 check. Queen g8 would be a mistake because bishop e5 check leads to mate. Pretty cool mate. So you have to play queen f8. Then rook takes check, king, king g7, rook f5, and white wins. Although white could also win with rook b8 and be at four connected pass pawns ahead. But rook f5 keeps the extra piece, so that's better. So queen takes g7 was played anyway. 
forcing instant resignation. That's a Capablanca game I didn't know. It was played in San Sebastian, 1911, before Capablanca was world champion. Okay, and our number five player of all time is Anatoly Karpov. And this is my favorite Karpov victory. I've shown it many times on the stream, but probably most of you haven't seen it. And the problem with Karpov is he has like 100 famous games. So I wanted to show one that was brutal. Okay, I don't want to show one where he wins the end game by one tempo because then you guys would fall asleep. Okay, this was a Dragon Sicilian when Karpov used to play E4 a lot. This was the candidates final in 1974, which de facto was the World Chess Championship because the winner of this match would play Fischer and Fischer stopped playing chess. Fischer was never going to play in 75. He didn't play in 73 or 74. Why was he going to play in 75? So the winner of this match would basically become the world champion. Even though they tried to get Fischer to play, they didn't try hard enough. Okay, no, I'm kidding. They tried pretty hard, but it's hopeless. Okay, so Karpov played G5 attacking the knight, and Korshnoi said, but, but I have G5 protected. That's why I put my queen and my rook here. I wonder if he actually said that. And Korshnoi played, rook takes G5. Thanks for the free pawn. Now we just, another interference. We've seen one today already. Rook to D5. Interfering with the queen and the rook. You can't play knight takes rook because you get mated in two moves, which would be good for white. Okay, you can't lose your rook because then you're down a rook. So there's only one move to play, and that's rook takes D5. Knight takes D5. Once again, in case you forgot, maybe you forgot. You can't play knight takes knight because this checkmate in two moves. Okay, so in this position, white's threatening, knight takes e7 check, winning the rook on c8. No, Korshnoi didn't do that. So Korshnoi played rook to e8, and now you can't play knight takes pawn check. Karpov played knight f4. He's got two knights, one for each of you. And now his knight's going to come in and, and do an amazing attack. If it's white's turn to move, white could take the knight and then put his other knight on d5. Or he could play the move knight h5, which is very exciting. Okay, then if pawn takes knight, rook g1 check would win. But anyway, Korshnoi played the move bishop c6, and he said, I want to take all of your knights. No checkmating me. e5, blocking the black queen from the fourth rank, another interference. Also threatening pawn takes knight. Okay, black played, bishop takes d5, e takes f6, e takes f6, queen h7 check, queen h8 check. And in this position, black resigned. If he plays king e7, I wouldn't resign because some of my opponents would play rook e1 check and forget that the queen is defending it. And then black checkmates white. Okay, instead... We play knight takes bishop check. If you take with a queen, then I play rook e1 check. And then I'm winning. And if you don't play, if you play king to d7, I play knight f6 check. And if you play king to d8, I play queen f6 check. And white's up a knight and white's checkmating black. But up a knight is enough. So after the move queen h8 check, Korshnoi resigned. Even though that was the candidate's final, it was de facto the world championship since Fischer didn't play in 75. And this match led to Karpov becoming the world chess champion. And he played so many matches with Korshnoi, and Korshnoi was close a couple of times, but never, never became world champion. If only Korshnoi had beaten Karpov, he might have made my list. Maybe. Okay, now we have number four. And after number four, people are going to get really angry. Okay? I'm afraid to show you number four. Okay, you guys are going to come to my house and beat me up. Okay, because nobody's going to agree with this. I'm the only person on earth who puts this person at number four. Everybody else in the world puts them at number one. Man, the truth hurts. And that is the former world chess champion, Magnus Carlsen. He made number four. That's pretty good. Okay, now obviously, unlike the other people on the list, Carlsen's in his early 30s. So... He's got like 10 more years of playing great chess, then he can move up the list. 
but I'm not going to put somebody who's like 33 years old as the best player of all time. Sorry. Okay. Lasker was world champion for like 27 years and he's number 10. The truth hurts. Steins was world champion for 28 years. He's not even on the list. That's a tough list. Okay. This is my favorite Carlson game and it was played when Carlson was a little kid. Carlson was like 14 or 15 years old. And this is against his fellow Dutchman, uh, although, although Magnus isn't Dutch, but it was a Dutchman playing in the Netherlands. That's why I got confused. This was played in the chorus tournament, which is now called Tata Steel, but it's in Vikonze. And this was played in the C group when Carlson was 24, uh, 84 FIDE. For comparison, my highest rating ever was 2563. So Carlson's rating here is lower than my peak. So very suspicious. Carlson's known as a boring endgame player who wins drawn endgames. Okay. And this game was when he was a kid. When he was a kid, he didn't necessarily do that because, you know, he was a kid. So, okay. So he played the move knight g6, very aggressive. Okay. Putting his knight on pre takes. Queen takes e6 check. Now, we'd like to play rook f7 to defend our bishop, but then pawn takes pawn is annoying. So Ernst played king h8, and Magnus just took on g6. He said, I don't want your bishop on e7. I want to checkmate your king. I wonder if he said that. Okay, knight g8, defending the bishop on e7, defending the pawn on h6, and attacking the bishop. A multi-purpose move. Knight g8. Bishop takes h6. Magnus doesn't care that black defended h6. G takes h6. Rook takes h6. Magnus sacrifices all of his pieces. Knight takes rook. Queen takes, threatening queen h7 mate with advantage. That's not easy to stop. It's an obvious threat, but how do you stop it? Another obvious threat is g7 check. So black is up a rook and a knight, but his king's not doing so well. Ernst played knight f7, stopping both threats. Pawn takes knight. White's down a rook, but white has four pawns for a rook and a mating attack, very similar to Anand beating Ivanchuk in our first game. King g7, rook to d3. Black doesn't have back rank mate because Magnus is stopping that with his queen on e7. Rook to d6, rook g3 check, rook g6. Now here it looks like white can play rook takes rook, king takes rook, queen takes rook, and white's up material, but then Magnus gets checkmated. So he can't do that. So instead he played queen e5 check, king takes f7, queen f5 check, rook f6, queen d7, checkmate. Winning the game. Checkmate is good. Now in this position, if black moves his king instead of getting checkmated and won, Magnus can play rook e3 check, which defends e1, and then Magnus can take the rook on, on g6 and whites up several pawns and has a mating attack. So instead of doing that, he just walked into checkmate, which is funny. So that was Magnus's one of his most brutal wins, and I, I don't know if he was even a grandmaster yet. He was in the C group in chorus, but Magnus was well known when he was a small child that he was going to be really good, especially after he drew Kasparov when he was 13. Okay, speaking of Kasparov, number three of all time, I have Gary Kasparov. And Kasparov was world champion forever, and he had to beat Karpov. He was beating Karpov match after match, even the one they drew. Okay, and this is uh, one of my favorite Kasparov games. I first saw this game in the book Fighting Chess, which has been reprinted and there's a second edition. And Fighting Chess showed a lot of Kasparov games from the 70s and 80s. This game was played in 1980, and this is against Joseph Pribble in the European Team Championship, 1980. Kasparov has white, black's played F6, so you already know how the game is going to turn out. I mean, come on, you can't play f6. Kasparov played d7, sacrificing his bishop. Takes the bishop. Queen c4 check. So if black plays rook f7, we can just queen. And then we take and we win. So he has to play king h8, which he did. 
Knight takes g5, Kasparov wants to play knight f7 check. Notice black's pieces over here aren't doing very much. Kasparov was famous for sacrificing material for an onslaught of an attack that couldn't be stopped. Bishop f6, now if knight f7, our king can go to g7. Knight e6 instead, attacking the rook. Knight c7, getting the knight back into the game. Knight takes rook, rook takes. Now black has two pieces for a rook. Black has defended the d8 square, and black's knight is sort of back into the game instead of being on a6. Rook d6, threatening rook takes f6, which gets all of black's pieces off of the d8 square. So for example, as Yasser Serwan would say, let's play the move a6, rook takes f6, rook takes f6, and we queen. So obviously white has a very serious threat here. So Pribble played bishop e7, and white queened. This was the move of the game, promoting his pawn to a queen to make black's pieces move to the wrong squares. A brilliant move, and in this position, he played the move bishop takes. If you take with the rook, I can trade rooks and play queen f7. Okay, threatening queen f8 checkmate. And if queen f8 isn't checkmate, like you play here, so it's not checkmate, then you lose your bishop. And then in this position, if you play queen d5, I can trade queens and then play rook d1 and I win a piece. And I win the end game because I keep checking you and taking everything. Okay, so Pribble played bishop takes d8. And now white played the move, rook to queen c3 check. You have to play king g8, and then rook d7, threatening queen g7 mate with advantage. Bishop f6, stopping mate, queen c4 check, black has to play king h8. Queen f4, threatening the knight on c7. What are we going to do about that? Well, if you play bishop d8, you get mated in one, and you lose a rook. And if you play rook c8, defending your knight, you lose your bishop and get mated in two. So you're not going to defend your knight, and you can't move your knight because you'll lose your queen. So he played the move queen a6. He said, you can take my knight, and then I'll take this pawn, and black has three connected past pawns for the exchange, which has been pretty good. And Kasparov said, no, 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 I was just kidding. I don't want your knight. And he played the move queen h6. When your knight's hanging for two pieces, you probably think the guy's going to take it. But queen h6 threatens queen h7 mate, and the only defense is to resign. White's queen and rook are too strong. But the move of the game was d8 equals queen. Okay, and that way white's rook got to go to d7. That's a real clearance sacrifice. You're basically sacrificing your queen to play rook d7. Luckily, it was just a pawn, and then white's attack was too strong, and Kasparov won. Kasparov I have as number three of all time. Uh, a lot of people have him one or two with Magnus. Most grandmasters think Magnus is one and Kasparov is two. Some people have Magnus is two and Kasparov is one, but of course I have Magnus is four and Kasparov is three. So you're probably wondering who's number two. I'm glad you asked that. Number two is Bobby Fischer. Go Bobby Fischer. Flipboard, and this is one of his famous games, which all of his games are famous, from the book My 60 Memorable Games. That's where I first saw it. Most of Fisher's games that I know are from that book because I had that book when I was a kid. Okay, so we have Bobby Fisher at number two, and uh, Fisher was world champion for a very brief time because, you know, he also was crazy. If we're going to have a top 10 crazy list, I'll put Fisher at one. Okay, but maybe he wasn't. But if we take chess and crazy, then he, he's number one. And some people think that's important. Okay, and uh, Fisher had the black pieces. This was in the Olympiad in 1960. Now, in 1960, in March, Fisher turned 17 years old, and he was playing on the Olympiad team, probably board one. Okay, because in 1963-64, that's when Fisher won the U.S. Championship 11-0. And obviously, you know... In 1963, Fisher won a game against my dad. 
Okay, so I put Ananda on the list, number 10, because me and Ananda are like that, son. And Fisher played my dad, so Fisher's number two. So that's pretty good. And I think a lot of, a lot of grandmasters would put Fisher at number two or number three. I think very few grandmasters would put Fisher at four or five. I think it would be like either Magnus, Fisher, Kasparov, or Kasparov, Magnus, Fisher, or something like that. That's what most, most grandmasters, I'm not most grandmasters, I'm me. If you want to see every other grandmasters list, they're all the same. Why do you want to look at that? Okay, and so this is a famous game because uh, Fisher was black. In this position, material is equal, but obviously the king safety is not equal. White's king is very exposed. And Fisher, even before I was born, way before I was born, he knew my rule, always sack the exchange. And he played rook takes e3. He played rook takes e3 again. And then this position, Fisher played one of his most famous moves, confusing the audience. If you've never seen this move before, th this is your lucky day. You're going to like this move, I guarantee it. And that move is queen takes f4 check. Okay, with the obvious idea of king takes queen, bishop h6 checkmate, an unusual checkmate, whites up a lot of material. And in this position, uh, white resigned. Um, if white plays king d3, obviously black has two pieces for a rook and black is crushing white. If you play king e2, it's the same thing. Knight d4 check and we win the bishop on f3. So if you don't resign, you have to play uh, king to to f2. And if I remember Fisher's analysis, it was like knight g4 check, king g2, and then I think knight e3 check, king f2, and then maybe it was bishop to d4. Or maybe it was knight to d4. I remember Fisher analyzed this in my 60 memorable games and he showed that he was winning easily. So, of course, if I was white, I would never resign. I would play king f2 all day. And then, you know, Fisher would beat me in like five more moves. And in this position, black's only down the exchange for a pawn. And he has a winning attack against, against white's king. So he ended up resigning. Okay, a very, and also I think this move wins because the rook is trapped on a1. So bishop takes b2 is going to get all of my material back plus some. So a really brilliant move, queen takes f4 check, and he had to sacrifice the exchange before he played queen f4, and he had to realize after king here, knight g4, that he was completely winning. Very machine-like, but Fisher wasn't using a machine because it was 1960. In 1960, people were begging Fisher to use the machine because then they would beat him, but he didn't do that. He was the machine, okay? And this was before Florence. She wasn't even born yet. Okay, that, and then my, the greatest player of all time, I'm the only person who thinks this, unless you follow me and you're like, I like what Ben Feingold says. So when he says some crazy stuff, I'm gonna agree with it. But if I never said this, nobody would say it. But I have to say it loud for the audience in the back. The greatest player of all time is Paul Morphy. Okay, and Morphy, the reason I have him as the greatest ever is because he was way better than everybody. Kasparov was better than everybody, but Karpov was close. Capablanca was better, but Lasker was close. Lasker was better than everybody, but Capablanca, Stein, it was close. Botvinnik, Smyslov, Tall, Petrosian, they were all about the same. They just took turns being world champion. It wasn't clear who the best was. They were all the best. So nobody was dominating chess. Everybody was about the same as number two, number three. In some tournaments, Capablanca would win, Lasker would win, Alakine would win, Petrosian would win, Tall would win, Smyslov. It wasn't clear who the best was. It depended on what day it was. However, when Morphy was playing chess, there was no doubt who the best was. He was way better than everybody. He got to a level of chess that was so far above everybody else, I don't know how he did it. Unless he went into the future, got better at chess, and then went back. I don't know how Morphy got so good at chess. If nobody else was good, how do you get good? If you're in a chess club and there's 10 players rated 1,000 and you only play people in your chess club, 
How do you get to 2,200? You can't. All you're doing is playing thousands. You play like a thousand. Maybe you can get to 1,200 and be better than everybody. And somehow, Morphe was way better than everybody. Okay, so I have him as the greatest of all time, and I have to flip the board. Okay, and this is a typical Morphe game. The kings are on D1 and D8. Very suspicious. Okay, and again, when you ask me whose turn it is, if it's black's turn, black plays bishop takes queen check, so, so it's white's turn. Okay, and this was a casual game, as were many of Morphe's, played in 1849 in New Orleans against Eugene Rousseau, who I've heard of, but based on the way he played chess, I don't think I should have heard of him. Okay, but maybe. Okay, and Morphe has the white pieces, and he finishes in Morphe style. He plays rookie eight check. Basically, all of Morphe's combinations would be the greatest combination I ever played, but I never get to do any of this stuff. Okay, his opponent took his rook. He played queen takes c8 check, king e7. A typical low-rated player would play queen takes pawn check and queen takes rook, and then black would play queen g1 check, and I don't, I don't even know who would win the game. Queen g1 check's annoying. Okay, I don't think black's going to lose. Black's either going to mate white or perpetual. Okay, but queen takes b7, that wasn't what Morphe was thinking about. And he definitely wasn't thinking Arby's. Morphe played the move, knight takes d5 check. Okay, now if two grandmasters were playing today, then black would resign. Okay, because after pawn takes knight, we have queen takes queen winning the queen. Okay, and that's like normal. It's knight takes d5 wins the queen. You can't take with the queen because my bishop on g8 is defending my knight. And when you have the white pieces, that's a very unusual sentence. My bishop on g8 is defending my knight. Usually your bishop's not on g8 in the opening in any kind of chess. But black didn't do that. Black played the other legal move. King to d6. Okay, now Morphe has two mates in one. I'm sorry, he only has one. I thought queen d8 was mate, but I forgot about king e5. And then I would have lost if I was white. Although, I think after queen f6, I wouldn't lose. And then king e4, and then d3 looks like mate. I would have won, but I would have been like, I would have said mate, they would have moved their king, and I would have been embarrassed, Then I still would have won. Okay, by the way, I did that once when I was 1800 in a slow game, I was playing another 1800 and I said checkmate and they moved their king and said not yet. And then like five moves later I checkmated them. But it was still embarrassing for me. Anyway, Morphe played the actual checkmate, queen c7 checkmate. The very night Morphe was sacrificing, he used to defend his queen for checkmate. That's a very unusual piece configuration for checkmate. I think I've never seen that. But Morphe won a lot of brilliant games. I tried to find one you didn't know, but you guys know a lot, so I don't know. Anyway, let's recap. If I can remember, I won't have to remember. I have Anand at number 10, go Anand. Number nine, Lasker. Number eight, Tall. Number seven, Spassky. Number six, Capablanca. Number five, Karpov. Number four, Carlson. Number three, Kasparov. Number two, Fisher. And number one, Morphe. Now, Probably of all the videos I've ever made in my life, this one will get the most hate on YouTube. Okay, the haters are gonna love this video. So tell your friends about this video so they can leave a nasty comment. They can say, you have Magnus at four, you hate Magnus. You're a Morphe lover, nobody thinks Morphe's any good, you're the worst. Why did you put Spassky at number seven? Terrible. I just like to point out for you Morphe haters, Bobby Fisher, who's pretty good, most people agree he was pretty good, he said Morphe was the most accurate player who ever lived, and if he was alive now, he would crush everyone. He said that in the early 60s. Okay, so don't take my word for it. Take Bobby Fisher. That was one of the crazy things he said, but still, it still holds true today. And Spassky got a raw deal because Spassky's famous for losing to Fisher. But Spassky was a great player for like 30 years a very top player. He was top five in the world for at least 25 years. He was world champion for six years, and he was a great player. But he gets overlooked because of Fisher. Fisher beats Spassky. Everybody's like, who's Spassky? He's the guy who lost to Fisher. Okay, but don't underestimate Boris Spassky. And after this video, look at some of the games of the players I gave. 
make your own top 10 list, compare it with your friends, then you won't hate my list as much because you'll see your friends list is different than yours and, you'll, and you're not going to like it. But as long as you have some of the same people, that's all that matters. If you have 10 different people on your top 10 list than I have, that list isn't good. You should have at least six or seven of the same people, at least. I'm Grandmaster Ben Feingold. I want to thank Rob Venerous again for sponsoring the lecture. If you want to sponsor a lecture, contact my wife, Karen. Her email is karen at atlchessclub.com. And I'll see you guys next time for another lecture. Bye, everybody.